Hello lovely people, I'm K3N and welcome to this week's Wonky Wednesday. Um, this week I'm going to do a wonky hand stitch, slow stitch take on string quilting, which is a quilty thing. Um, I made a lap quilt for my son years ago using st the string quilting technique. I don't have it to show you because obviously he's got it, but anyway. Um, this was requested by Alessandra. Hello Alessandra. Alessandra who, if you remember a few months ago, inspired the fusion crochet stitching box that we made. Um, so anyway, she sent me a picture by private message of a traditional machine piece string quilt and asked me to do it wonky. So happy to oblige Alessandra. I hope you like what I've come up with. Um, so what you'll need, you'll need some kind of foundation cloth. Now you're going to end up with a double foundation cloth. So it needs to be really thin. This is some really old worn sheet. Um, and you're going to make squares from it. So whatever size square you choose to do, that will be the finished size of your square. So if you want to make bigger ones to make a rice bag, for example, then you know, you'd want to do a six inch square or so to start off with. I'm going to put these in my journal. So I've got a square that's maybe four and a half inches, something like that. Um, and you need to make two and then they're cut and recombined. So you, you whatever you need, two squares and that will you know, that'll give you two squares. So if you wanted to do, make those finished squares into a four patch, then you'll need to make four squares. Do you see what I mean? And then you'll have four, you recombine them, put them back together, you've still got four. Anyway, witter, witter, witter. Um, you'll then need some strips of cloth. Now, because we're kind of, you know, I know we've gone away from log cabins a bit, but I'm still sort of in that theme. I've chosen some dark cloths and some light cloths, but you could e easily, equally, and easily just make them scrappy and you'll need little strips and um, the strips don't necessarily have to be the length of your square you'll see how I've made the dark one already I'm going to make the light one here with you um, because here and there do you see I've pieced there that was too short so I just stitched another bit on and I've done them all fluffy raw edge um, because I think you know that's what I that's what I felt like doing you could equally not stitch them onto a foundation cloth if you wanted to you could equally just take all your strips and stitch them together with a seam, you know, just right sides together like that um, until you had a, a piece big enough made of all your strips and then cut a square out of that. But I'm going to do it at fluffy edges. So I've got some light scrap, scrappy strips and some dark scrappy strips. And then you need at least two foundation squares and then you'll need two more later, so four in total. I feel like I'm rambling, but anyway, I hope you understand. you'll understand when you've watched the whole thing, hopefully. Um, and then I've got some normal sewing cotton, because I'm going to invisible base the strips onto the cloth in the first place. Maybe some little applique pins here and there if necessary. And um, that's my normal sewing cotton, like sewing thread. It doesn't have to be cotton. Um, sewing thread or basting thread. And then I've got some various bits and pieces of different kinds of thread for embroidery later. So, I've done this one already. You see, all I've done is invisible basted strips of cloth onto my backing square. So, I'm, and this is my dark, obviously. So, I'm going to do my light. Now, just to show you, I've shown this a few times in the past, but I'll show it again. If you want a little hand sewing project and you don't want to be measuring all your squares and all that, just get a strip of your background cloth that's the right width, the size you want your square to be. And then you can just have that strip in your work basket. And when you need a square, you just fold the end over on a diagonal like that. And then you make a little snip just down here. And then you tear your square off. Get rid of the stringy bits. And there's your square. No rulers involved. Once you've got the strip the width you want it, then you get a square. I won't say a perfect square, but you know, you get a square every time the same size. So I've got my little pile of scraps. I'm just going to lay them on. And now you do want to kind of stick with the horizontal lines. You'll see at the end that that's kind of what makes the pattern, you know. If you want to vary it and try different things, then you go for it. But, you know, traditional string quilts, you get strippy lines. So I've got this little bit of something, something. Um, and you just cover the square. So you're just up to the edges. If it's a bit short, like here, with another bit of the same cloth, but maybe to make it a bit more interesting, I'll choose something different. 
Be a bit of this raggedy. And because that's only a tiny bit, I'm going to pull that back a bit, I think. And stitch that on, and then I'm going to stitch that on, you know, so it wasn't just a silly little bit at the end. Well, not silly, you know what I mean. So I've got a knot, invisible baste, if you don't know. And I'm going to start about a quarter of an inch in-ish from the edge. You come through from the back. You take a tiny back stitch on the front and a bigger stitch on the back. And you could equally just running stitch them on straight away, but I thought it'd be nice to invisible base them. And then when I've cut and reassembled them, then I can do my fancy stitching. Um, I might have to stop and take my jumper off in a minute. I've just taken Stella for a walk. You know that thing when you go out and it's quite, well, it's not cold, it's quite mild, but anyway, you go out in the cold with the jumper on, then you come back in, in, in the house and you're warm, you know, you know that feeling? Anyway, that's what I'm feeling at the moment, warm. So I'm coming nearly to the end of this strip. I'm just going to put my other bit on. Over, and I overlap by a good quarter inch or so. I've also chosen quite fine cloths because of the thickness. I'll just go through the back of that new strip and stitch it on. Still with the invisible baste. And just until I get to the end of my little foundation cloth, or you know, a quarter of an inch or so from the end, and then I'm going to turn and um, just take one stitch down a bit, not right to the edge, but you know, because I'm going to overlap the next strip. And I'm going to turn that over, keep my stitching thread well out of the way, and then with the snippy snippies, I'm just going to cut that off level with the edge of the backing. And the same the other end. Let me just move those things out of shot just for now so that they're not, you know, probably not. you've all got it and you've gone back to whatever you were doing and now you're just listening to me. But anyway, <laughs> I'll try and keep it looking reasonably tidy. At least the bit you can see. So now I want another strip. I'm just going to choose what I think goes nice next. Thick, how wide they are doesn't really matter. I've got this really skinny bit here. I'll put that on. They, they, you know, the width can vary as long as you overlap so that the backing doesn't show through. That's quite long, so I'm going to trim it in advance. And I need to turn it the other way. If, of course, if you want to put pins, I might actually because that's quite little. I might just put a pin in the far end. If you've got a bigger square, of course, you probably will want to put pins because you'll have great long dangly bits otherwise. So I'm just going to come through from the back of my new strip. Whoops, get caught on the edge, always happens. And um, now I'm going to just invisible baste along, sort of along the top edge of that. So I'm going through the new strip and the previous strip through the overlap and of course I'm going to get a knot in my thread because I've got a lazy girl thread. Something about stitching on a desk, I hardly ever get tangles and knots when I'm stitching on my knee. I don't know what it is, I'll try and remember to twist my needle every stitch, just give my needle a little flick so that it, the thread doesn't get twisted. So, I'm just, you know, I don't have to tell you anymore, it's, I think it's clear what you have to do, so I can witter now, witter away. I just, I've got something really on my mind that I just need to get off my mind about Monday, if you're, if you're following the Monday project, and I will mention it again next Monday for those people who don't watch Wonky Wednesday. Um, I did a stitch sampler of some stitches used in canther embroidery, <coughs> excuse me, um, in preparation for next Monday where I'm going to make a little canther inspired embroidered motif and while I, it was quite I had issues with the video I, I don't know what it was it's just things kind of went wrong I had to do a lot of editing I crept out of shot I had to do some zooming in when I was editing which is something I've only recently discovered how to do you know to make the picture more central in the frame and it took it took me many hours to to make that video, um, so it just 
kind of upset me, uh, not upset me, but, I, I, you know, I felt uncomfortable generally. And for some reason, towards the end of the video, when I was filming the last bit, I looked at the work I'd done and I kind of felt irritated with myself that the piece of work wasn't wasn't it wasn't clear it wasn't it wasn't that it, I didn't like it or it was messy or anything but it, it, I wanted I had in my mind a vision of having all the stitches in straight lines so that you could all see them and I wanted you all to you know get them and understand how you made them and so on and it wasn't it had gone off on angles and I'd half finished some rows and it, it just made me uncomfortable and so I later made another one sitting here on my own another stitch sampler and I posted it on the community page saying that the one I'd made in the video looked like a dog's dinner I think was the phrase I used um, where's my pin gone? I'll put it back and a few people mentioned in the comments and they're absolutely right and I had actually already thought of it myself that I've been telling you all year that it's all about the process and the finished thing doesn't matter and you know, it's the story of the piece and, and so on and so on. And then I go and say, oh, I'm not putting this in my journal because it doesn't look right. I'm going to um, make another one. So while I was walking with Stella, I was thinking about it more. And yeah, I, I felt, I think I felt like a bit of a hypocrite that I'm telling you all this and then I go and do something different. Um, and then I thought, well, no, it's, you know, you have to, part of slow stitch is being mindful of what you're doing, but also being mindful of what decisions you make and why you make them. So I thought, right, come on, Catherine, just just think about that. Think about why, why did that upset you so much? So it was partly, like I said, all the technical issues that I had. Um, I'm now looking to make sure I'm staying in frame, which I think I am. Um, Partly trying to uh, teach stitches that, I mean, I did practice the, the stitches that were new to me, the, the Marla stitch in particular, um, but trying to teach those stitches when they weren't second nature to me in a way that you all understood. Um, and I've done another little video this morning, Tuesday, just of the Marla stitch. So that was made me a little bit anxious. But I also was wondering... And this is maybe the most interesting part of all this wittering, if there is an interesting part. Um, if it was something to do with the blindfold stitching last week. Uh, in the Monday project, I invited you to stitch blindfold, inspired by and aided by a lady called Yvonne, who's in the Facebook group, who is blind. Um, I wondered if it was in response to that in some way, that because I'd done that exercise without my sight, and I'd done it here for the first time. I just did it, you know, live. I mean, it was recorded, so I could have edited, obviously, but I didn't. But I did it on camera. And I kind of did it without, not without thinking, because I put quite a lot of thought into it. But I didn't really think about how it would affect me personally to do that. So I wondered if it was in response to that as well, stitching that piece so not out of control but but without my my sight sense of sight that because i've kind of noticed in the work i've been doing you know privately on my own since then that i have been paying more attention to being precise and so on um so while i was walking in the woods just now watching all the lovely leaf colors falling and a little breeze blowing and you know it's lovely had fall, leaves falling on me as, as I walked along. Um, I wondered if that was a response that, you know, if that was a response to the blindfold stitching. And um, and then I straight away wondered if any of you who have done the blindfold stitching have had a similar experience when you've gone back to, you know, if you're a sighted person, when you've gone back to your normal stitching, if you are finding yourself paying more attention to how it looks, having done that exercise when you couldn't see what you were doing. So that was my thought process. And apologies if you're only here for Wonky Wednesday and you've got no clue what I'm talking about and, you know. <laughs> um, but no, I, I, I think it's, I think it's a good thing that these projects aren't all taken in isolation. You know, if you're finding that, that 
and, and I've tried to, I try to vary things so that there's something for everyone. I try to vary things with the Wonky Wednesday and with the Monday, so, you know, because there's a, a lot of you watching me for which I'm very grateful. But it also means there's a lot of different tastes and levels of experience and, you know, everybody likes different things, don't they? Um, so, yeah, so I, I thought having done the three weeks in a row that were kind of, I called it a mini-series, so we, the first week where we pulled uh, the thread from the edge of the cloth and stitched it back in, um, and then we did the sensory one with the textures and so on. And actually going back to the Enso as well, because many of you said that you'd stitched your... I'm going the wrong way now. Many of you said that you'd stitched your Enso with your... Uh, sorry, you'd drawn your Enso with your eyes closed. Um, so that was a whole theme for a while there, I think. Exploring the senses and, you know, and so forth. And to suddenly go from that back to embroidery, which is much more technical, and you know you have to make stitches that look a certain way. I think in in hindsight it was maybe a big a big jump, um, and yeah, and I wonder if that's why I I got a little bit agitated and upset that my work didn't look how I wanted it to look. And um, I think since I've wittered on for probably 10 minutes about all that, I can't possibly witter on for another 10 minutes and say all the same on Monday. So I'm going to have to refer people to the beginning of this video if they're interested to know. Um, and I'm very grateful to you, Alessandra, for suggesting this. Because this is right back in my comfort zone. <laughs> and it's just what I need. I even feel that my hands are shaking a little bit and I, I don't, I'm not aware of feeling anxious. Um, maybe a little bit talking about that because it, yeah, I did feel, I, f I felt like I'd kind of let you down in some way or I don't know, not not being, not, not stood by what I've been saying all year and what I've been, you know, my what my practice has been in my own life for the last 10 or 12 years, something like that. But I, yeah. And so then I stopped and thought, well, if that's true, there must be a reason for it. And so I wanted to then share that with you because I felt like I'd, yeah, not, not practicing what I, I don't like to say preaching because I don't, I hope I'm not preaching. But you know the expression, practicing what you preach, that's what I mean. So that I'd, you know, I'd, I, I was asking you to do something and then I'd flown in the face of it myself. Anyway, that's all that. Let's forget about that now. That's said and, you know, well, we don't have to forget about it. Feel free to comment further. I'd be interested to know, especially if any of you have felt um, similar, a similar thing happening. If you did last week's. Uh, week before last. So now I'm back to just stitching little raggedy scraps of fluffy edge cloth onto a foundation. Oh. And isn't it lovely? Oh, sigh of relief. Not, I mean, I, I love the canther, but I'm not an embroiderer. I'm not Marion, you know, you may have noticed. <laughs> well, not that I'm not Marion, but I mean, Marion is a very skilled and experienced embroiderer who knows all those, you know, very technical stitches. Um, and I don't have a lot of um, embroidery experience. I I use some of those stitches, but you know I do it in a very wonky way. And um, I did want to teach it or show you demonstrate properly in inverted commas. I'm still going on about it. <laughs> so going back to the invisible base, which I do think I could do in my sleep. I nearly said with my eyes closed. Um, it's very, very soothing. Turn it. <laughs> so, yeah, so although this isn't actually log cabin, getting back to the subject in hand, so some of this lovely buttery coloured linen. It's 
and fold it into a triangle on point, but that doesn't matter. It's got the selvage, so I don't really want that because that's quite thick. Just maybe two strips of it is enough. I don't know if it's going to tear. Sometimes linen's a bit... Oh, it will. Often linen will tear along the weft and not along the warp, or vice versa. Another bit now, about the same width. And that behaved perfectly. <clears throat> um, I've been seeing on the news about dreadful flooding in Spain. I hope if you're watching from Spain that you're you're safe and that your loved ones are safe. It's been quite dreadful. Yeah, so basically you just keep stitching your little strips on until your square is covered. Um, let's just, I'll tell you about some of Stella's new friends. Honestly, I think she's in her element to have so many doggy friends. I don't overlap that very far, I'm just going to pull it in a bit. That's a good reason not to trim the end until you're done as well. If you need to adjust, then you've still got leeway if your strip's long enough. And if it's not, you just stitch something else over the top. Yeah, Stella's got so many doggy friends now because where I walk her is quite... Especially if you go kind of first thing in the morning or in the evening, those are the, you know, the high volume times, the, the busy times. And she she's, seems, to, well, of course she does, she, she recognises when she sees a, someone she's played with before. When I say someone, I mean a doggy someone. Dogs are people too. Oops, she, she recognises, you know, you see her ears go up and she looks ahead and, oh, that's my friend Poppy or that's my friend Petey or whoever it is. And off she runs. And then if it's a, a new dog that she hasn't met yet, her ears will go up and she'll look. But you see her kind of weighing up, is that a friendly dog? And... And then she she must dogs must have ways of well of course they have ways of communicating, and then her tail might gently start waving, and then you'll see the other dog's tail gently waving, and the next minute they're racing around as if they're you know as if they've been best friends for life. That's lovely to see that. On the other hand, what's not so lovely is her new hobby is still fox poo. Yes. She is a holy terror with the fox poo. That is also salvage, but it's really nice and I want to use it. It's off my old penny. I might use it. I might use something thin in between and then use that afterwards. That's really thin. That's a bit of old duvet cover and I think it's poly poly cotton, but it doesn't matter. Yeah, and she's got fox poo radar, if that's the thing. She's a fox poo seeking machine. So I keep an eye on her. I try and keep her in front of me. You know, if she wants to sniff something that's behind me, I turn and watch her and wait for her to catch up. Um, but she's so quick. It's like, there's fox poo, and she's down. And her, her head's down, and she's trying to get as much of it on her as she possibly can. And I haven't yet tried the ketchup trick. My vet actually mentioned that to me. Um, when I took her for a booster, I had bathed her, but there was still a whiff of fox poo, so I apologised to the vet. Um, and then a few people here in the comments have said about ketchup, and also some of my neighbours and fellow dog walkers have said it. So I'll definitely give that a try. But I can't bath her every day. Or it wouldn't be good for her coat for a start. And so, yeah, I really hope she at one point... She is, she's nearly ten, and I don't really remember at any point in her life. I mean, certainly in France, I don't ever remember her rolling in fox poo, really. And there were foxes around, of course, in the woods. 
I, and I wonder why she's doing it. I wonder if it's got something to do with her having moved. I don't know. I'm trying to look for deeper meanings and things. It's probably just, you know. She did it once and she thinks it's fun, so she carries on doing it. Right, so let's get this other bit back in. It's a little salvagey bit. So now I can stitch it, although it's a bit thicker if I stitch it over this thin bit and then stitch a thin bit over it. That should work out okay. And this Friday is um, Park Home Life. It's Park Home Life Week. Those are still fortnightly at the moment. Um, so I'm looking forward to sharing that with you. And I haven't moved my furniture around again, if you watch Park Home Life. My furniture is still where it was, in the living room. But there has been quite a major change in the kitchen. So I'll show you that on Friday. Um, and um, yeah, I've made a few more blinds for some of the windows. And, you know, it's been nearly two calendar months now that I've lived here. September, October, November, yeah, nearly two calendar months. And it feels like, it feels like home now. And I'm very, um, very happy about that. All right, I now need something thin, I said, didn't I? This bit. So it's got a bit of embroidery there and it's been rust dyed at one point. So it's not quite long enough. I'm going to take some of the plain area. Which again is not, not quite long enough. So I'm going to move it along. Can I get away with that being the last bit? Just probably. I'm going to move it along a bit so I can add a bigger bit on the other end. I'm going to put some pins because the overlap's quite small. Maybe just a pin. And then when I've got this bit sewn on, um, I can show you the next bit. Come on. And of course, if your strips are too short and you add another bit, it doesn't have to be the same. Oh, I did that up there. No, I was going to say it doesn't have to be the same bit of cloth, but that's maybe obvious, unless you want it to be. You could also join your two bits of cloth together with a little seam first and then sew them on as a strip if you like that look better than, you know, this kind of thing going on. So I need one more bit about that wide. I'm going to put the fluffy edge overlapping because I like the fluffy edges. Come on off. Like so. Put another pin. And then I think I've just got enough thread. It's amazing to think that we're in November and I think there's seven weeks left of the year. So seven more Mondays and seven more Wednesdays, I think. It's been an eventful year all round, I would say. Um, and what I am going to do as well is just go down to the edge of the strip. Or, you know, just a little bit in from the edge. And do just another row of basting. just to hold it, hold it down. So I'm about, not quite a quarter of an inch away from the edge. I'm doing a forward stitching, I don't know why. 
it's not wrong you don't have to do the back stitch for the invisible baste I just find that you can get smaller stitches with a little back stitch than if you go forward and it does kind of lock it more if you then if you subsequently cut it for some reason I've got nearly no thread left but I'm going to call that good enough So that's my light square. I'm going to tidy all this away. All the bits can go in that corner to be sorted later. Um, I'm going to trim from the back again all the sticky out bits. Just so it's more or less, you know, within the bounds of the square. I'll bring my dark back in. So this is important that you do this the right way. Excuse me, I have to open the drawer because I need my ruler and pencil. I forgot to tell you, you need a ruler and a pencil or something straight, a straight edge and a pencil. Or, a, you know, a blue pen or a friction or a marking, whatever, for drawing on fabric, on cloth. Um, so, now this is important. So you need to lay your squares with your strips both going the same orientation. So I've got my strips going horizontally in both cases. It doesn't matter if you've got them both vertically, as long as they're both the same way, that's the important thing. So I stick with them horizontal. So, and then you need to draw a line from corner to corner on the diagonal. And that line needs to go one way on one of your squares and the other way on your other square. Now it's easier to draw on the back and also then you won't see it. So I'm going to turn them over, making sure that I keep them oriented the same way. I hope you're looking up. Sorry, I didn't say look up. I hope you looked up. If you didn't look up, just rewind about, you know, 60 seconds or something. So now, and I can see by my invisible basting stitching lines that they are still both horizontal. So that's a checking. So now I want to draw, I'm going to go top left to bottom right on this square and just draw a line from corner to corner. If you have rotary cutters and all that gizmos, you can, you know, with a proper ruler, proper quilters ruler and rotary cutter, um, just cut straight away because these are cutting lines I'm drawing. So bottom left, uh, sorry, top left to bottom right. And then on the other one, I need to draw it the other way. So I'm going to go bottom left to top right. I hope that's clear. So I've drawn the lines perpendicular to each other rather than parallel. Is that clear? It won't work. If you do it wrong, it won't work. <laughs> so it's really important. So I'll just recap. So you've got your stitches, your, your strips all going horizontally on both squares as you look at them. So you want one diagonal line going one way and the other diagonal line going the other way. Not not like this, but like this, okay? So now you take some scissors. I meant to bring bigger scissors here, but I didn't, so I used the snippies. Um, or a rotary cutter, like I said, but you just take your scissors and you cut. And don't be scared. Don't be scared, just cut. There we go. So I've got two triangles of that. And I would recommend drawing both lines before you cut and then check checking and double checking that you've done it, you know, one one way and one the other. Because if you cut one and then go and draw your other line, you might not remember which way you drew the first one, if you see what I mean. All right, so now I've got four triangles. <clears throat> so I'll put them back how they were. Do you see that's how that was? Do you see it's matching up? And that's how that was. But now I take one of the light triangles and I put it with the dark triangle. So now do you see that I've got in the dark triangle the strips are going this way and in the light triangle they're going this way. And then if I take the other two, the dark one and the light one, I've got the same thing. The strips are going this way and they're going this way. If I had drawn the diagonals the same way on both, you wouldn't have that effect. Do you see? Do you see? So now it kind of looks like a log cabin because you've got, you know, the strips going around each other. But instead of the square light and dark pattern happening, it's the triangle light and dark pattern. 
So now we have to stitch those back together. If you'd done, if you'd pieced, like I said in the beginning, you know, if you'd pieced your pieces with seams, and then you can, when you've finished your piecing, you can cut yourself so that they're both squares the same size, and then cut them on the diagonal in exactly the same way, and then you could just piece them together with the seam, then right sides together, like that. But because I've done it like this, I need to join them. Um, there's many different ways you could do that. I'm going to put them onto another foundation. That's why I said use something thin. If you want to look up ways of joining, I will try and remember to put a link, but if I forget, in the Wonky Wednesday playlist, quite near the beginning, is a video called Join Log Cabins Joining Blocks. And there I talk about a couple of different ways to do it. Um, but what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to get myself, that's now going to chime 12, I'm going to get myself two more squares exactly the same size again and that's now stopped <laughs> and um, I'll just do one now actually on, on, on camera this is exactly the same for both of them and then I'm going to lay this down as a foundation cloth, a backing cloth. Lay my triangles on. Butt them up. I'm going to put a few pins. And then I'm just going to do some stitching. Now you could, if you wanted to, do more invisible basting now to hold everything there um, or you could just go straight away into the slow stitching probably if I was doing this for myself I would go in invisible baste and what I might do is just invisible baste either side of that that diagonal line um, and round the edge I might just do that actually And if you just make sure again that your pieces are all within the bounds of the, the background square, it will all be the same size. You know, all your squares will end up the same size. So you see, if you done did a bigger one, obviously it would make a beautiful rice bag, as would most things. Um, what you could also do, actually I will just show you the other one, is you can play with all those log cabin layouts that I talked about again right back I think in the introduction to wonky log cabins because you've got a similar kind of block with the two half square triangles the light and, and light and dark if you've done light and dark so you've got that one and imagine you had this one as well and imagine you had several of them you know you see you can play there with the placement so you could have them alternating up like that or you could put them like this and do a bigger square in a square and actually if you did that that would make a nice side for a rice bag if you did four and join them together for one side of a rice bag <laughs> um, you could put them you know like this and then you can just play with them so I think it's great I mean thank you Alexandra for um, making the suggestion so I'm going to just do some invisible basting like I said I can find my number nine needle, which there it is. Oops. So I'll do, how are we doing? Oh, we're okay. And, and a few of you have said you quite like the longer Wonky Wednesdays, so. Um, so I'm gonna start by just going up one diagonal, I think, just to stabilize it. And also, again, if you wanted to have the back showing and, and you didn't want to do invisible base, well, maybe I'll do that here. Just get a matching thread and just do running stitches. Or you could, you know, incorporate it in some way into your fancy stitching. Just do some overcast stitches or cross stitches or whatever. I think I'll do that as well. Incorporate something over the diagonal line. But first of all, I'm just going to... I just want it, you know, held with stitching. So it is a bit thick here and there, but it's doable. And I have got here and there quite thick 
fabrics, I've got uh, cloths, I've got um, you know, linen, I've got cloths that have been rust printed which can be sometimes a little bit resistant to the needle. So I've got three or four layers in some places but when they're lovely old soft cloths they're, they're okay to go through. But I wouldn't use kind of upholstery fabrics or you know that kind of thing. So I've been down that side nearly. And if I wanted to do the same down the other side, I probably would take a darker thread, but I'm just going to do it with this thread. So now I just want to be really sure. With the corners, you might want to you might have to push them in again, you know, they want to fly out. I'm just going to make sure that it doesn't. And then you just want to make sure that you really butt them up as best you can. You could, of course, also um, stitch something over the join. You could get an, a strip and lay it on, like, you know, and stitch it over the join like that and make a feature of that. I'm showing you something if you've looked down again. Um, I might do some couching over that. That's kind of what I thought I'd do. We'll see. We'll see, we'll see. But just as I go along, I'm just pushing with my thumb to make sure they stay butted up. I think I'll do invisible base this side, since the thread's light. And you see here that's coming up because I didn't stitch right to the, the end apparently. You know, where I, I cut between the stitch, but it doesn't matter. Invisible based on the strips in the beginning holded, holded them, held them enough to enable us to cut them and stitch them back together again. You could put some lace over there, you know, you can do anything with that, with that join. You can, like I said, just mend it with stitching, you can view it as mending. Some kind of stitch that goes through one side and through the other, like a cross stitch or a whip stitch. Um, You could put something in behind, you could even pull them out apart slightly and lay something behind like we did if you follow the Monday project with the Kintsugi. So you could make a feature of the join in that way. You know, you could put a strip of gold cloth behind or something like that. Or red cloth, which would kind of be a nod to the log cabin tradition. Hmm, that would be cool, I wish I'd done that now. I might do that with a different one, with another one. So if you did that, then you could cut a slightly bigger background square and, you know, put these pieces with a, a gap in between. And, um, yeah, and then lay a strip of cloth along the diagonal underneath them. It's not that it's thick there, it's that there's a piece of silk that's been rust printed. Anyway, I'm through it. And it's only the odd little piece here and there that's a bit resistant to the stitch. It doesn't bother me. Right, so I've got the diagonal done. And I'm just going to invisible baste all around the edge. Maybe I'll running stitch all around the edge. I don't know. I'll mix a stitch around the edge, however you would like. Um, if you then wanted to join this to um, other pieces, obviously I wouldn't then put yet another backing square on. I would use one of the joining methods that I talk about in the video that I'm going to link. Or I would put all the pieces, like if you were going to make a four patch, you had one, two, three, four, I'd cut myself a big backing square and then stitch all the pieces to it. If that makes sense rather than, you know, making little ones and then having to join them. So one of two things, either go and use one of those joining methods with strips in that video, um, or stitch them all to a bigger backing cloth. And then you've only got the, the diagonal joins to be dealing with. OK, 
Okay, and I've gone all around the edge except for one edge because I think I used that edge to stitch in my journal. So I've just left the bit of thread attached. It's possibly not enough, but you know. Um, and taken my needle off so it's not dangling about, plus I want to use it. So I had some thoughts in advance about what to do over this gap. I had thought I've got this bit of knitting yarn that's quite thin that I could couch that over. So I'm just auditioning how would that look. But I find that quite liney, which is not, you know, not pleasing me. So I think I might use this red embroidery floss and I might do some cross stitches or something like that or maybe even just some straight stitches so it looks like a, a mend. I'm going to get two strands of it. Just because I like stitching with two strands, that's just me. You do you. Um, there's my needle on now. And I'm going to do that, that first before I start doing any stitching on any of the rest of it. Any fancy stitching. Just because I think that will, um, you know, just to stabilise that really. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry, I made a funny sighing, groaning sound. <laughs> well, that pin doesn't need to be there anymore. Right, so am I going to do... Because you see how it does that, so you need to do something about that. Um, and so you do need to do something. I mean, if you put a strip of cloth behind, that will stabilise it. Or if you put a strip of cloth over the front, like I said, you know, something like, like that, that will stabilise it. But otherwise you need to stabilise it with stitching. So the stitching needs to really go from one side to the other. I think I'm going to do cross stitch. That's what I'm going to do. With my great long lazy girl thread. It's super long. It's just how long it happened to be. I think I'm going to do them one at a time rather than make a whole row, row of lines going one way and then come back and do them the other way. I don't know. I, I think um, there's a difference to how it looks. I have the impression that there is. I did a video way back, way back about cross stitches and different ways to do it. And I said that there and I showed both ways and many of you said you could see a difference as well. Which might be auto-suggestion but, you know... So I'm just pulling it as tight as it needs to to just keep those two edges butted up. And I've finally realised why it is, not why I get tangled, well I know why that is, that's because I take too long threads, um, why it is I keep, I was, I was moving out of shot all the time. Um, I think it's not to do with my chair, which was what I thought. I think it's to do with this camera stand, which is dif a different one that I used to use in France. Not the actual stand, but the clamp that my phone's in. And I started using the clamp that my phone's in because it's got a bendy arm. So without having to find my little tool and adjust the actual bracket, I can just bend the arm up and down to a degree, you know, if it doesn't need to be that much different. Um, but what it means is where the camera is on my phone is at the end of the phone, you know? And because the arm's also sticking out, basically it meant that centre shot was much more to the left than I was used to. So that's why a lot of my videos recently I've been down in this corner <laughs> because I thought that's where the camera was. So now I've realised I have to be sort of more over here. I hope it's now better. Um, I have to go back to doing what I did right back in the very beginning, <laughs> which was just when I was working on the cutting mat, just out of shot I had little strips of masking tape showing me where I had to stay. But I've got, you know, I've got blasé. I got to thinking I didn't need to do that anymore. Anyway, I've sorted it out now. Thank you for your patience. So I'm just going to do this row of cross stitch all like this in and out like this. Sometimes I'm going to do this. I'm not going to do that there, that's that thick silk. Um, 
all butted up against each other all the way to the end. Okay, there's my line of very wonky cross stitches of all different sizes. But you see, just with the stitching now, it's sturdy. It's not falling apart anymore. It's the stitching's holding it. And you see on the back that, because of the way I make the stitch, I get these little... I often think, and I haven't yet got around to it, that it would be nice to cross stitch on the back and get that mark on the front. I'll do that one of these days. Um, yes. I will. Okay, so what am I going to do on the rest of it? Well, I don't know really. Just probably some 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 stitching. <laughs> That's probably what I'm going to do, some stitching. Mm, some of this. So again, so you could stitch dark thread on your dark and light on your light to really emphasise the difference. Or you could stitch light on your dark and dark on your light to bring it together. Maybe I'll do that. I feel like bringing things together might be what's required. I've got this, this is wool so I'm going to get a bigger needle. So it's some eco dyed wool from a friend of mine with golden rod and iron. Oh no, gall nut, can't read her writing. Gall nut and iron. And it's lovely but it's quite thick. So you need a big needle and it's still quite hard to thread. Especially when you're on camera and you get performance anxiety. <laughs> oh, it's not anxiety. I don't know what it is. Just talk amongst yourselves while I thread my needle. There we go. Done it. Yes. <sighs> Relax. Um, and it's quite twisty and because it's two ply and um, and it's quite fluffy. But it's <laughs> it's lovely. <laughs> It's tricksy, but it's lovely. I'm only going to take a short length because of the tricksy nature of it. Um, I don't know what to do. Sorry, I did my sucked my teeth. You know that sound? That was me sucking my teeth. Apologies. Helps me think, but it's pro probably not very nice for you. Um, I think I'm going to do some of those sort of rune stitchy, stitchy type things, which is basically. Just little vertical stitches and this random bit. I'm not sure I'm going to stitch the whole piece because that might take me another hour. I'll do a bit of it with you. Um, I just did want to say that this is, I love this, this is wonderful. Thank you Alexandra, Alexandra, I'm sorry. Uh, Alexandra is Portuguese and her name is written with an X, which in English we would say Alexandra. But in Portuguese, an X in her name at least, I don't know if it's always, is a sh sound. So her name is Alexandra. Um, yeah, thank you for suggesting it. And I'm very much looking forward to see what she comes up with. She is um, Alexandra Almeida on um, Instagram. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing her surname correctly. I will put a link to her Instagram down below. And she's also in the private Facebook group. So many of you will have seen her wonderful work there. So now I've come, this is what I do like to do sometimes, I've come to this edge. I just like to kind of put these little sticky stitches, what I call rune stitches, don't know why I call them that, I think they look a bit like ancient writing if you do them wonky, just over the edge of the piece. And um, now I want to do that all round, I'm going to jump and do some more around there. Oops, don't put it too tight. So this week, like I said, is Park Home Life Week. So I'm thinking next Friday, a week on Friday, I will do part one of making the journal with the eco print papers that I made and, and cloth that I made last week. Because I don't want to, I mean, I think more than three videos in a week is, is too much. <laughs> um, more than three. I think three videos is more than enough probably for some of you. <laughs> I mean, you don't have to watch all of them, obviously, but... 
Um, so yeah, so I think that's what I'll do. And then I don't know if that will become regular every other Friday will be Park Home Life and the in-between Fridays will be the journal for as long as it takes me. Or, um, you know, I'll see. I'll see. I think I'm just going to do some French knots along underneath this fluffy edge. Two wraps. And now I'm really back into slow stitch stitching, which is responding to the cloth, responding to the shapes and the colours in the cloth with your stitching. And then once you start stitching, you then respond to your own stitching, the other marks that you've made. So it's n absolutely not, and I keep saying this recently, but I. I think there's, I don't know, uh, there's been quite a few comments recently about slow stitch and what it is and what it isn't. Um, probably in response to things I've said. And I'll say again quite clearly that my definition of slow stitching, or my perception of slow stitching, comes from Claire Wellesley Smith, who wrote the book Slow Stitch. Um, So yeah, so it's not only running stitch randomly done over the surface of a piece of cloth. It's about being mindful of the work and yourself and um, a big part of that mindfulness is responding to the cloth and then your own stitching. And that, and that takes you right down into the process rather than in the beginning looking at a piece and mapping out exactly what stitches you're going to do where. Yeah, I know I didn't deliberately do that, but you see how my French knots have lined up there? So I'm going to carry on with that. So that the work has suggested that to me. I didn't plan it. So I could have said either I don't like them lining up, so I'm now going to do them, you know, not lining up. Or I'm going to say, okay, you want to line up? Let's line you up. Yes, we like that. And now I feel like going back again. Have I got enough thread left? But that's another thing for me is often I respond to how much thread I've got left in my needle. Um, so if you were doing conventional, traditional embroidery, Say you were doing a flower, so the petals would be green and the petal and sorry, the petals would be pink and the leaves would be green and the centre might be yellow, you know, whatever. So then you'd you'd use the thread accordingly for each element of the picture. But now I've got this much thread left. It's this precious thread from my friend. I could put it in the orts, of course I could, it's still a usable bit. But I think no, while it's in my needle, I want to use it further. I think I'm gonna put some sort of square crosses in between these little French knot sets that I've made. So for me that is also paying attention to the materials rather than saying right I'm you know I'm gonna do a pink flower with a green. It's just different I'm not saying one's better than the other or anything I'm just saying it, things are different. And to me it's just an element of it, I've just, that just occurred to me because I looked at the thread and I thought there's not much of you left, I want to use you up. Um, so now I've done my three crosses, and I've still got a little bit left, I could get a few more stitches out of that. Um, <clears throat> so I might just hop over I think to the other side over to here and I might just take a few running stitches this is a big needle and thick thread so it's a bit harder to get through the layers okay and I've just got enough now to finish off Right.
And there we go, that can go in that all sorts of little bits. So I've, I've made a start, so I think I'm going to go and do a lot more stitching on that little piece this afternoon, probably. And um, that'll be the photo that you'll see on the finished, you know, on the front of the finished video. Um, and then I'll put it in my journal. And then I'll show you it in, in next week's video when I put whatever I make then in my journal. Um, because, you know, it's already quite long. And like I said, that's many more hours. So I'm going to probably do as intensive stitching as I've done in this area over the whole piece. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed that, Alexandra. I hope that lived up to whatever expectations you might have had. And I hope that you enjoy it, Alexandra, and everybody else. And thank you so much for watching. And I look forward to you joining me next time for more Cloth Tales. Bye-bye.